that this presentation will be recorded today. And I turn the floor over to our newly graduated. Um, happy to introduce Claire Ogborn, who is a new uh, master's in public health as of this evening. Uh, and she will be doing the introduction today. My name is Deborah Levine, and I'm the director of the Harlem Health Initiative. Welcome and thank you. Claire? Yeah, thank you, Deborah, for that intro. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's uh, skill building webinar on behalf of CUNY School of Public Health's Harlem Health Initiative. Um, I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Kareen Zodom. Dr. Zodom is a psychiatrist and is the medical director of behavioral health services, behavioral service, behavioral health homeless services for New York City Health Plus Hospitals. Um, additionally, Dr. Zodom is a clinical instructor of psychiatry at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Zodom, it's such a pleasure to have you with us today and thank you for joining us. Uh, and uh, without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to you for your presentation which will be followed by a discussion. Um, and last notes for everyone in attendance, uh, please turn on your cameras if you feel comfortable doing so. Um, mute yourselves when you're not speaking and please put any questions in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Zodom. Hi guys. Um, you know, I, I, when Claire and Deborah asked me to do this talk, I. I I was horrified and say, why would you want me to do something like that? And I don't even know what, what to talk about. Um, and then we met and discussed a few things. Uh, we are in a health crisis. And one of the things that I'm really passionate about and I always have been is, um, is homeless psychiatry and homelessness in general. Um, and, it's, and, and a lot of people are hopeless about it and I, I'm coming. This is a discussion. Uh, although I'm a health and hospital employee and NYU employee, I want to uh, share with you that you know whatever I share here, it's it's not a representation of my organization. It's those are my thoughts, and and I, I welcome um, everybody's input and ideas and suggestion. I want this to be a discussion. So here we go. Um, a lot of people usually when I give this talk live, I, I have this provocative slide um, that that brings people that that that. That brings people to why we talk about this. And you know, whenever we think of homelessness, a lot of people think of this. These are headlines from, from newspapers, right? And hinge homeless men slash GPS worker, you know, I feel like punching somebody. So a lot of homelessness, as it's it's a homeless individual, uh, undomestic individual in New York City are considered very dangerous. Um, and there's this real fear um, and, and stigma that has to do with homeless that, that do with homelessness that I wanted to bring everybody about and you know does anyone in 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 who wants to share that thought about this slide um and if I, I can see it, all of you guys so I, I if anyone has a thought about it I, I'm, I'm I want to hear it okay so today I'll be um, defining homelessness, talking about ep epidemiology of homelessness in the country and in New York City. Um, I'm a psychiatrist, so I'll talk about homelessness and mental illness now. And I will also, you know, talk about why a psychiatrist talk about homelessness, uh, factors contributing to homelessness, comorbidities and, uh, of homelessness, and what is the system doing, um, what's a clinical approach uh, that, that, that is taken from the system. So there are many definitions of homelessness. According to the uh, to HUD, uh, the person who's chronically homeless, uh, uh, it's somebody who's accompanied, uh, an accompanied individual with disabling condition um, who has been in, in has been continuously homeless for a minimum of a year or at least four episodes of two years. So HUD has a specific definition of homelessness. Um, and, DHS defines somebody who's chronically street homeless, uh, somebody who uh, nine months out of 24 or two straight years were, were, were in the street. And then that, that also what 
are defined as long um, long term shelter stayers, those who are in the community uh, for 730 days in the past four years, in the community meaning the shelter. Uh, recall that this does not, in this definition, we're not talking about those who couch surf or sleep on the floor in their parents, which those, those are also in some ways defined homeless. Uh, you sleep in that friend one night and that, that with another friend the other night. Um, so the, the, the HUD is really restricted in that definition of homelessness. Um, that other further definition um, of when you move out of chronic homelessness, um, you know, heard in DHS was defined somebody who's homeless. It is an individual who lacks a fixed and regular adequate nighttime residence, right? Maybe you include those who can't serve at this time, an individual who's definitely lose their primary nighttime residence within 14 days. Um, and, 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 and a company of youth uh, under 25, um, um, you know, who, who um, lives in a livable condition, um, um, an individual who is fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence. Um, we talk about a lot of DV um, uh, interpartner violence as well um, and abuse um, and, and, and have to seek shelter uh, at find house homes. In the United States, this is the map of the statistics of 2020, an estimated amount of people experiencing homelessness. Uh, and this is for 10,000 people. And when we look at the map, uh, New York City has about 91,000. That was as of last year, 91,000 people. You know, uh, with the pandemic, this is likely higher. Uh, we're comparing to, it's always very baffling to me. I've lived in California before. We're comparing to California. Um, which has a much higher rate of homelessness. And, 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 and you know, um, and most of us know why. Does, does anyone want to bring the reason why here? Or like, do you prefer to, uh, Claire, can you assess in the poll if people prefer to ask questions at the end or if they want to discuss? Uh, it's hard for me to moderate the conversation. You may want to take the questions at the end so that okay. we can organize them for you. No problem. Okay, okay. sounds good. Um, and so California, of course, because of the weather condition, uh, usually in California has less resources than New York City in terms of homelessness, has such a higher, higher rate of homelessness compared to New York City. It was not always the case. Um, when we look at the largest cities of homelessness individual between um, the past year, we're here on the left, we saw that New York had the largest increase between 2019, 2020. Um, and, but, the past 13 years um, is also a significant increase, um, a 54% increase in homelessness in New York City uh, uh, among, among that time. When we, sh when we narrow things down to people who are unsheltered or street homeless, New York actually has one of the lowest rates, and, and I will discuss why that is uh, soon um, amongst, amongst all the other states. Um, California, again, when we think about unsheltered homelessness, California has the highest, and New York has one of the lowest in the country. That was as of 2020. Um, this is the homeless dashboard that I thought was interesting to see as of 2021 because of the pandemic. What have you done uh, last year? Uh, in terms of, you know, we have family with children, a total shelter placement here in June, things were a little higher uh, in shelter placement. Um, uh, as the pandemic, that things are, after people start getting vaccinated, things uh, improve slightly here. And uh, adult uh, family total in shelter placement here remain steady uh, between June. Um, I think the eviction notice, um, uh, the eviction decree also had people stay in one place for a while, uh, which helped stabilize these numbers. I, I'm, I'm suspecting things are increasing significantly now, right now. And this is from DHS and the single adult shelter exit from, to supportive housing, again, was pretty high. Um, uh, people were placed a little more around December and then it just fluctuated to the time. 
when we break it down into a number of homeless people sleeping each night as of June of this year, um, the highest amount of people each night sleeping, the, the, the demographic is mostly single adults. Uh, uh, followed by adults in family and unfortunately, um, actually followed by uh, adults in family and unfortunately um, children are right here at a little higher than adults in family when it comes to uh, a point in time, um, uh, the, the, the municipal count that's done yearly. When we break this down um, into demographic and race, we see that uh, amongst uh, homeless individual in the shelter in 2021, um, families with children uh, were highly over uh, 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 black and non uh, black non Hispanic uh, family with children had a high representation about 52% and then Hispanics about 41% of of individuals uh, here in this population and the rest are others. When it came to adult in families. So we have families and children, adults and families here. Again, we're seeing a high percentage, a higher percentage of uh, Black uh, non-Hispanics. Um, this is consistent as well in single adults, which is even more significant for single adults. Uh, 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 we tend to see single adults uh, uh, at a higher like, likelihood of uh, homelessness than, than others. But here we see more of people of color um, being more homeless, and this is just DHS uh, in twenty in the year twenty twenty one uh, track until June. So we can potentially become homeless. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I think uh, if if I was engaging you, you see any one of us. Um, we, we, no one is immune um, to homelessness, but in general. Um, that there have been many causes of homelessness that we are aware about, and you know, one is poverty, uh, eroding work opportunities, um, when we see uh, in, uh, uh, decline in public assistance, lack of affordable housing, uh, lack of affordable health care here, um, domestic violence we talked about, mental health and decentralization that I will discuss further into, and of course, addiction disorders. The last two are a big piece that we usually see, um, which is why as a psychiatrist, I talk about homelessness. Um, you know, 54% of homeless individuals have a behavioral health diagnosis, and it does not have to be schizophrenia or, uh, or, or, or bipolar or SMI, you know, the longer an individual is homeless, the more trauma prone he is, if, he, if the individual had not had a history of trauma already. So one night is one, and then over time, three, four, five days in the shelter system with people either on the street or the shelter system with, you know, people in a variety of stages in their lives, um, exposed to elements in nature and not having necessities, chips away at one's identity and self. And so we see 54 people of, that's what a lot of psychiatrists and mental health workers are called into work with those who are homeless um, because there's a high prevalence of individuals who are homeless experiencing mental health, was a behavioral health diagnosis. Um, and then followed by substance use, I will talk about this 53% of chronic disease um, that will come in uh, with, with this, and then incarcerations. I think this, this, this wouldn't, I, I hope it wouldn't surprise you when we look also uh, at systemic factors and, 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 uh, and who, does this page, the, 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 when we look at the homeless individual, what are that demographic, whether it's age, um, uh, race, and gender, you know, this is it's about the same demographic of, of who we see, uh, especially in terms of who, are the, who is likely to be incarcerated in the United States. And I broke this into um, system that I will explain. When we think of homelessness, uh, we think of different system. Of course, we have the street, we have the correctional system that we really want to think about, right? Um, and we have the medical system and then the housing system. And, you know, a homeless individual usually go between all this system all at once, a revolving door. Um, amongst individuals, amongst adults entering the New York service system between 2008 and 2018, the majority of them were released from prison. 
So the gray ones here, it's uh, people who were released from prison, followed by those who were released from medical or psychiatric, um, um, psychiatric hospital, and then other facilities like nursing home. And, and then, you know, and then we have finally Rikers, um, um, and former inmates of mental illness arrive here. So this is how, it is, it is, this is this is the system we're facing. This is why we're looking at the demographic of those who end up in the street or end up in the shelter. Uh, New York City is a special place uh, because of that court order right to shelter, which is which is also challenging to uh, 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 to navigate through. It's very political. Um, uh, Department of Homeless Services was created in 1993. Uh, and it's exclusive to, to, to New York City. Um, and the mission of the Department of Homeless Services is, you know, when possible, which is a very key point, provide safety temporary shelter uh, to address unsheltered homelessness. Um, and then providing services and support and outreach and helping meet the court or the right to shelter um, uh, uh, that, that was placed uh, when the city was sued years ago for not uh, providing uh, shelter to an individual who was homeless. Um, because we have DHS, like, like we need to talk about this just a little bit, um, there are over 300 total shelters in New York City uh, managed by a range of nonprofit social services and shelter providers. Um, it's important to keep in mind that although New York has DHS, uh, there's only so much that DHS can do, uh, which itself is another issue. Um, this is, does not have medical assisted living or respite shelters. Um, the appropriate clients for the shelter at DHS are those who uh, independent activities of daily living. Um, you know, I highlighted the one, <laughs> the danger to self of others, um, because that's subjective. Um, you know, that certain uh, factors who determines who if one is in danger. Uh, uh, to themselves, um, you know, and, and sometimes somebody is released from a hospital or a psychiatric hospital that a flight risk to danger to themselves, which is not always the case. So a lot of patients with homeless experiencing mental illness have, have had the stigma of uh, it's been a barrier for them to get into shelter because of where they come from, because of mental illness as well, and because they've been labeled with this danger to self or danger to others. If they look angry or they were angry during that mission, they went well, it becomes a barrier as well. So that's one thing we've been uh, uh, dealing with over time. And it, it has been an ongoing conversation between organization and DHS to define this term. Uh, of course, that patients who are truly in danger to suffer others, that patients who have attempted suicide um, and, and have tried to harm others when unwell or when using in the community, but you know, there's a fine line between who is defining those terms uh, to allow them in the shelter or not. Uh, DHS also provides shelter to about 40,000 40, clients um, per day. Uh, and most of them, like we said again, are, are single adults. In New York City, when an individual is homeless, um, there's a traditional route and non-traditional route to get into the shelter. Um, and so, for you know, if if I'm homeless today, uh, and I will meet, I will fit into these criteria, uh, I, I I have to go to one or two places, and one is Help Women Shelter in Brooklyn, or Franklin Shelter, which is an assessment shelter. And so, um, you know, a, a single adult uh, woman will go to the shelter and um, get assessed, uh, regardless of the status, and then. Uh, from then, the shelter would then decide which appropriate shelters they will go through, whether it's a mental health shelter or just a, what black shelter sometimes called general population, gen pop shelter, depending on the diagnosis, depending on records that the person presents with. Uh, for a single adult man, they go to the third street men's shelter, which is right close to Bellevue Hospital Center, where I work. That's the only place where single adult men can get assessed. That's an intake shelter where they go in and they assess, they stay there until they're placed into another, uh, uh, to more permanent shelter to receive services. Uh, for adult families, uh, uh, 
the adult family intake shelter uh, in the city is the appropriate shelter to go uh, to go to to receive services. And then families with children less than 21 or pregnant women uh, go to PATH, which is Prevention and Temporary Housing Shelter. Again, the understanding is that the shelter will not turn anyone away. As soon as they show up there and they say, I'm homeless, uh, they should be taken, but it's not always the case. There are many nuances to that. So from all of these, these are intake shelters, individuals are taken into, I, I, I then move into different shelters. So if, for example, an assessment shelter doesn't have space, DHS will move the individual to, a, uh, to another area, including a church bed, to have them sleep under a roof um, for the night. And then the, the, the purpose of the shelter is to find some type of affordable housing or housing from the person, uh, for the individual. And for individuals with mental illness, it's a, a severe mental illness, especially they meet criteria for different categories of housing. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll go into it today, but it's, it's a different process. So not all individuals in the community who are homeless have the capacity to present to a shelter, um, depending on the, the severity of their illness. And so that the street outreach teams who engage these individuals in the community and help them uh, put them into a safe environment, usually it's what's called a safe haven or a stabilization bed. Um, and this is only through those who are engaging with street outreach teams. And of course, when it's the there's a this is very cold or very warm, these individuals are usually removed that capacity and, and uh, to decide if they want to stay out and stay in, they're usually removed and put into a place where it's either warmer or cooler until things differ. So for chronic or street homeless individual, they're engaging with an outreach team. And again, they end up in these places um, safe and where they can stay for as long as possible um, and prepare for, for housing. So the threshold to get into these uh, uh, is completely different than one um, who can present to an intake shelter. These individuals usually meet criteria and they were not able to navigate the system enough to get into an intake shelter. So they're helped by a street outreach team who has seen them out for months at a time, uh, either the subway or above ground on the tunnel and put them into a safe haven where they, they get a room, meals and cage management and sometimes psychiatric services. For youth, um, there are different agencies for youth uh, between 6 and 21. Uh, the NYC Department of Youth and, and Community Development has like safe housing and covenant house. These are the intake shelters for youth between 6 and 21. And of course, ACS Housing Academy um, is one of them. There are also traditional independent housing for this for, for, for our youth and then crisis services program and our wish borough based drop-in center, um, which serve as intake until individuals are put into permanent housing or appropriate housing um, for them. So um, there's a direct correlation, you know, speaking of mental health, uh, between the decrease of uh, availability in, in uh, psychiatric hospital beds and increase in crime and arrest. Um, uh, as, as you know, uh, in the 1990s, uh, around that time, a lot of state, ho state hospital closed and, and, and people were, who had been institutionalized for quite a while were, were discharging to the community, to community providers, and this really uh, wreaked havoc because then, you know, the patients were not prepared to be in the community after being in an institution for years and years and years. And many of those patients became homeless um, and were unable to navigate the system. Um, into today, we still see that today. Um, New York has found that 38% were discharged from a state psychiatric hospital had no known address six months later. So also institutionalization has not been the answer to everything um, with these patients who end up being homeless. The psychological effect of homelessness, uh, are, 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 of course, are numerous, and one of them is social disaffiliation um, and isolation, especially for single adults, and distrust. Um, by the time an individual has become homeless, um, that, that others uh, uh, lost all their family members, lost their support for any reason whatsoever, 
and uh, or have been disappointed by them so there's this real distrust of of the system in that uh, at times uh, providers whether it's nurse practitioners or social workers or case managers um uh, 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 you know sometimes talk about uh, uh, um, learn helplessness, they don't want to get help, they don't want the services, but you know, uh, we have to remember that we're not the only person who have approached them or the first person who have approached them and say, I want to help you. And this, these individuals have experienced a lot of trauma. And so, you know, when we approach them, we say, we really want to take care of you. What's the game? What do you want from me? What do I have to give you in return? And so there's that distrust of the system that comes in, which requires a lot of work around engaging individual. There's a lot of our customer social roles. Um, you know, a lot of street, the, the street homeless individuals I, 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 I've encountered, um, uh, you know, when I was doing street outreach, it's the concept of time. If you want to meet somebody at nine, the subway doesn't work. If they uh, doesn't leave on time, if the case manager doesn't come on time to give him a subway card, if the meal came late, breakfast came late, they'll be late to the appointment. So it's you know, we have this concept of time or, you know, other patients will say to me, you know, at 10 o'clock, that's where I'm pendling, pen handling at this corner. So don't come and talk to me at that time because there's this guy who work around the board, they got who always give me $10 every other day. So that's my appointment and let's base on that because they found ways to survive. And that's very important for those who work with individual with street homelessness. Of course, there's separation of family, there's rupture and there's the, the, in, in relationship. And I, I talk about this learned helplessness that, you know, um, you know, those who come and engage with, with individuals who have been street homeless for quite a long time uh, find that they don't want they don't want it anymore. It's not that they don't want it, um, it's that they've been disappointed. This is not the first time somebody is trying to help them. Why try again? Last time they tried with this organization, after that, uh, maybe they were incarcerated and, and they lost touch and nobody followed up with them and then somebody else. It's really that, uh, What's the point of keep doing this over and over? It that says a, a demoralization. Again, you know, we usually advocate and really champions for individuals like that who, who have uh, uh, learned helplessness. There's a social and, and, and criminal justice aspect to homelessness. And, you know, whether it's um, homelessness uh, in a shelter or street, there's a predicted increase in nonviolent crimes and, and people want to feed themselves. And, and so like, I, you know, uh, in Harlem or anywhere else actually in the city, I, I will see sometimes someone who's going to pick an apple from the guy in the street and things like that to feed themselves and they'll be chased, um, you know, so those are considered nonviolent crimes. Um, for shelter homeless, uh, symptom severity predicted uh, uh, violent crimes. So those who have suffered trauma are put in the shelter with somebody who's severely mental ill or going to withdrawal and the person is restless and paranoid and thinks about to take them. If the individual have, for example, schizophrenia, you know, and is not taking that medication and is unwell and there's somebody next to him who's screaming and kicking because of something else that's going on, it really create this really, really tense environment that sometimes leads to violence. Um, and among shelter homeless, 82% uh, uh, were men, 50% of women had a history of incarceration. Again, this does not surprise us when we look at how many percentage of people coming out of the criminal justice system who are um, homeless today. The, bio the biological uh, um, um, consequences or uh, uh, sequelae of of homelessness, you know, what, what we usually see people, it's not only mental illness, we see medical condition, um, those who have a seizure disorder who can work uh, for a while, um, those who have COPD, um, arthritis, wear and tear on the body is one of them, sleeping in the concrete, um, walking around without appropriate shoes and things that some of us sometimes take for granted that is very important, you know, back pain and, and such, um, falling, um, in the snow, if you don't have enough of your shoes, or getting assaulted, working on the broken arm and the broken rib, all these things. You know, conditions such as hypertension and diabetes and anemia are, are poorly controlled uh, because somebody wants to worry about eating, not taking the high blood pressure medication. And, you know, we won't talk about the, the DASH diet or the low salt diet when you need to feed yourself. Right. And so that's also chronic condition tends to worsen, um, you know, the dental and, and oral hygiene is 
significant also, and this can lead to infections in the mouth and systemic infection that are also um, uh, noticeable. These are the biological effects uh, that we see on those who have been homeless for a long time. You know, we talk, I talk about trauma that's not to be undermined um, here. Uh, you know, one thing that we see in the community is those who have had traumatic brain injury, um, you know, among homeless, lifetime, lifetime prevalence of those who have a traumatic brain injury, uh, who are assaulted, had an accident, um, uh, and, and that leads to a severe impairment and, and, and inability to function. Um, uh, 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 properly. And of course, there's physical trauma associated with homeless, increasing like likelihood of, you know, major trauma or stab wound or fracture, like I was, as I was mentioning uh, earlier, uh, associated with just the risk of being outside um, all the time and, and being exposed to the element. Um, there's a police-related trauma um, when I was talking about people of color and I, and I you know, I, something that I don't want to overlook. And, and I bring this up because unless we acknowledge this, uh, we will never address it. And so the trauma, uh, the extra layer of trauma for those who are severely mentally ill and people of color um, and, and homeless is, is, is the police related trauma. Um, you know, when we think about trauma, it's not only assault. I want to think about uh, you know, observing, watching somebody being brutalized, somebody who looks like you being assaulted all the time or being killed all the time creates also trauma and tension in oneself. Um, uh, experiencing harassment all the time or, 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 or the news, you know, flashing, uh, you know, this person got shot that person got arrested, that person was falsely accused, that person got stabbed, that person looks like you, it's also traumatic. Um, and it's also conjuring of hysterical memories of lynching that, you know, we talk about intergenerational trauma as well, that contributes to the poor outcome of people of color who are homeless in the community today. Um, and those chronic stressors can lead to what's called allostatic load and increase. So uh, 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 the combination of all these factors and stress uh, can lead to increasing diabetes and stroke and cognitive impairment. And, and these are important to take into factors when we think about uh, addressing homeless. When we think about uh, it's another layer to just being homeless um, uh, for people of color that is not to be dismissed. Uh, I think about the, I think I already mentioned earlier why the common mental health disorders um, and, you know, the bipolar disorder, this is where I usually engage uh, the audience and they, they get to answer this, but bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, those are the major mental, executive disorder, the major mental illnesses that we see, uh, depression is also um, one of them, truly really the one with psychotic features. Um, the substance use varies today. Alcohol remains the number one, um, uh, although there are more deathly ones, uh, as, as we all know, we're in an opioid crisis uh, lately, but alcohol remains the main, the number one um, common uh, uh, substance use for domicile individuals. Um, I'm bringing them again. When we when we think about addressing, uh, 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 you know, solutions, what do we do? Um, uh, how do we think about uh, addressing homelessness uh, in, in New York City and in general? We want the way I assess individual homelessness is really uh, thinking about systems. Um, and, and, and what I didn't bring here is also, it goes way beyond this uh, foster care system uh, is, is one of them when we think, when we go back into even childhood, um, because being in the, in the foster care system uh, increases, uh, we talk about ACE scores and trauma, increases the chances of an individual uh, being included in the system. When we take a history of somebody who's homeless, you know, we don't only think about the medical system where they've been or the housing system in shelter and traditional supportive housing or the correctional system, but we go way back to youth. Um, uh, those who live, who were in the shelter with their families growing up or those who were in foster, uh, foster care or involved with ACS um, uh, that, that we want to think about when 
approaching uh, somebody and try to help or assess someone who is uh, experiencing homelessness. You know, uh, we think about social determinants of health uh, and mental health, especially, you know, uh, you know, exposure. That is, so I think this reiterates what I was saying, you know, exposure with the major hardship, conflict, disruption, violence and crime, um, dep dep uh, material deprivation, not having enough clothes to go to school, not having shoes, uh, appropriate diet, uh, living in uh, an environment where there's, there's still lead, that can, where somebody can still expose to lead and have lead poisoning, financial strain, uh, limited education, are uh, also things to take in mind uh, when the, that will impact uh, an individual's future outcome um, that can that we can try to be repair that can try to repair and address when we, when we work with someone experiencing homelessness. And this is another way of looking at, at, at the system here. Uh, economic stability is the neighborhood um, in which someone is either receiving education, living, or even where the shelter is also matters. Um, food and, and uh, social integration and all this context um, of the healthcare system. Complex trauma is, is one that we also look at, uh, evaluate when we, we see someone who experiences homelessness. Uh, I talked about racially and economically segregated communities, um, foster substituted care, uh, but family member being incarcerated is traumatic uh, for somebody who is young, um, for youth, um, you know, being excluded from the family or uh, uh, kicked out of the house because uh, you, you're part of the LGBTQ community, um, is traumatic enough, and we see the higher, uh, 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 higher uh, demographic there. Um, uh, also, substance use, physical and sexual abuse, and life-threatening natural disasters uh, also increases in complex trauma. So it's not always what we think about; it's that that various things that play into role. And so we look at impairment. Uh, for because not everybody who's a homeless is not everyone is equal. Everybody has their own, can be their own story and you know their own strengths, um, their own challenges. And so we look at we look at impairment. Um, what has happened here? Uh, is it the loss of social support? Is that inability to work? Is there an illness that was uh, uh, that was not diagnosed uh, properly? Um, is it is the impairment education? Uh, you know, is 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 the impairment? Uh, is is it the forensic history that has prevented someone from from getting a job uh, and from maintaining a job uh, 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 and getting a place because they have a forensic history? Is is that what has been happening? How can that be addressed? Is that that somebody needs food stamps and public assistance and SSI and they don't have that? Would that help uh, someone? Um, get into housing and get the services they need. Um, is there the cognitive issues, uh, traumatic brain injury, does a person have seizures, was a person hit in the head before and not aware of, you know, what has really led to, to, to this presentation? There's always a story and none of them are always the same. And so the system approach is really looking at what has been happening from childhood and how do we, and look at social determinants of health and how do we really bridge that? Uh, when we think about homelessness, we always think of housing. And, and I want to say today, you know, uh, we, we're going to have a new mayor uh, who is very excited about, you know, housing, uh, has affordable housing for, for, for individuals. And there, there are more people who need housing in New York City than there are housing available. And so, but for those who are especially severely mentally ill, you know, housing has their challenges. You know, after someone had been staying in the street for a really long time, um, getting into an apartment that is quiet can also be very isolating um, because there's a certain social aspect of being outside that is often over overlooked. And then we sometimes as providers think, well, put them in an apartment, everything is solved, but it's not. So there's, there's so, so housing can also, it's an adjustment to some. Sometimes housing reminds someone of where they were assaulted and abused. So being in that four walls can be very frightening. So this is, this, this, this needs to be addressed as well. Um, for supportive housing, uh, you know, it's important to have the right staff who is trained, patient, flexible, um, and really amenable to work with, with and coordinate care 
um, you know, and this is not often the case because the work is challenging. So there's a high turnover, um, which causes cha causes challenging um, challenges to the system. And of course, there's a discrimination aspect. You know, for those who come from the forensic system, those have a severe mental illness or substance use, will not get into housing. And these are where policymakers need to come in and kind of break these barriers and advocate um, for services and 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 and. and you know, and change these policies about, you know, um, somebody needs to be um, sober and they can do, they can even safely do drugs in that apartment, otherwise they'll be a victim of all these things that come in. Or if they have the opiate use disorder um, somewhere in the housing packet, it, it creates uh, it, it creates havoc into that chances of getting into housing. So, you know, we try to avoid a uh, crisis driven, you know, work by working to the resources that I told you about how, when we assess someone, um, housing is one intervention. Um, of course, a clinical intervention in addressing that, a lot of street outreach teams that, that are out there to try to work with those uh, and provide care uh, with those who are not yet ready or willing, because not everybody, homeless is not a crime, not everybody wants to go indoors or are not ready to go indoors, but still provide services for them. And in New York City, um, there are outreach teams um, for those who are severely mentally ill um, and that in the hospital often they act team and there's IMT teams, um, you know, certain hospitals have a safety net clinic where a person can be seen regardless of the insurance or their status. Uh, they usually refer and they present and they get the services they need. Um, uh, there's this new initiative around Harlem called Be Heard, uh, because what was also, what we also found, I think you guys are pretty uh, uh, likely aware of this, is that sometimes the response to a crisis is extreme. Um, you know, somebody says that depressed, and the police comes in, and that it, it, things become scary and go haywire really quickly. And so, Be Heard is this initiative from the city, where the and I think one of them is in Harlem, or one is the Bronx, where the when someone calls 911, the, 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 the call is, is screened and diverted into a, a, a dispatcher that includes a social worker uh, for a further assessment. The police is not always included to be there to, uh, you know, to, to kind of help de-escalate and better assess the situation and send somebody to the hospital or send somebody to the clinic um, to, to, to avoid the possibility of violence and further distress from, from individuals. You know, um, we talk about uh, uh, recovery oriented certain patients, certain care um, in, in really assessing an individual where they are and, and base everything on what they want to be and where they want to be um, and, and meeting them where, where they are. Like I was saying, you know, I've had patients who choose to leave at Penn Station and that's where they're going to, they're, they're going to be until they're ready to come indoors. Um, and if they choose not to talk to me um, and let them be until they're ready, but continue to engage them because that's what they choose to, if they have capacity. Uh, and, you know, of course, it's engagement and not giving up on the patient and, and checking in our own burnout um, when, when we engage in trying to help someone and be trauma informed. Certain individuals, you know, the alternative is nothing, really. Uh, in psychiatry, we have medication and I won't go into too many of them, um, you know, and we really, the you have a low threshold of treating substance use, you know, uh, there's fentanyl strips and there's Narcan, um, there's safe injection sites now, um, you know, um, and of course with, with, with COVID, you know, it's mask vaccines that, that these show vents and street average vents right now that are offering um, vaccines for individuals, uh, whether it's for hepatitis or for the flu or for COVID um, to at least you meet somebody where they are and provide them with care regardless of if they want to come in or want to if, or, or, or receive that. You know, community resources usually is uh, linking someone uh, and engaging someone in the community in which they are to provide them resources. Um, you know, I you, there was a study that was done uh, this, this saying that training um, barbers and beauty shop and boys and girls club actually uh, uh, 
was an amazing way of taking the pulse of what's going on in the community. Um, you know, the barber, there was a study that was in you know, the barbershop knew more and could recognize if somebody was depressed and refer them to services. Or the pastor uh, knew if somebody, uh, how the community was feeling or if some of the community was concerning, uh, just provide them with tools because these are trusted advisors. If the, health, the, the mental health provider, it's not. Um, um, and, so those those are uh, uh, resources to tap into the community and to, uh, to and to have someone link to services or still provide the support. Um, and these are the steps into getting someone into housing. Um, again, I mentioned the street outreach teams here uh, include uh, in, in New York the Smart Outreach Consortium. Uh, in different part of the city, uh, there's there's above ground work. There's Below ground work in the Bronx, there's Bronx work. Uh, you know, in Brooklyn, in Queens, we have breaking ground, and these are just average teams, uh, 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 providers, and case managers who are pushing for the industry and try to assess them, assess their needs. Um, in Southern Island, there's part of hospitality, and of course, there's DHS uh, overseeing all this initiative. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you so much, Dr. Zodom, for your thoughtful and intriguing presentation. I think we'll have a lot to talk about. Um, we're happy to take questions from participants. Please be mindful of the time so that most people have you know, time to ask a question so that Dr. Zodom has time to answer. Um, you can put questions in the chat or you can raise your hand. Uh, I know Ms. Renee Mitchell, earlier you had your hand raised and we missed you. Did you have a specific question you'd like to ask or comment? Yes, y'all can hear me? We can hear you. Okay, what I wanted to ask, okay, she was saying that, you know, uh, breaking down the uh, stigma of how the shelter DHS is run. And I'm a person with lived experience. And I'm also, okay, the CEO of Breaking the Cycle Drop Poor and the co-chair of the Policy Committee for the National Collision of Homeless. I was homeless 20 years ago with me and my child. And I don't believe, I believe with the right tools, okay, anybody on shelter dealing with mental health, dealing with drug addiction, prison reform, okay, can move towards self-sufficiency, okay, to make healthier and better lives, because I did it. Okay, the, the way the DHS shelter is run now is warehousing people, okay, like cattle. okay? The case managers, a caseload is overflowed with like 50 or 60 people. That's setting them up to fail. You cannot move nobody towards self-sufficiency, help them get housing, help, address their drug problem, their mental health problem, if you don't tackle it from the ground root and address the issues from the door. So DHS, DSS, supportive housing, and all of them need to change the narrative, okay, and take the bandage off and take a new approach, like wraparound services all on site, okay, addressing it from the door, breaking the cycle one homeless at a time. That is my opinion and that's my suggestion and that's what I feel like a solution like that will work. Thank you so much. I completely agree. Um, I used to work in, in one of the women's shelter and it was um, one of the most frustrating thing, although, although the shelter is there, but for, I would see there, and I think Claire and I actually work when we're in the shelter, is the trauma of that, uh, of, of just being in the shelter itself and the services that are offered there. Uh, and it is multi, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's multifactorial. You know, there's not enough staff, like you're saying, you know, there's the shelter police that is there and there's a 
there's a security of the shelter that's there and people are stripped away of that things and not all the shelter have pro, uh, have um, uh, resources or mental health resources even medical resources to be there you know and, and it was a very heartbreaking place to, to for me to work into um uh, uh when i was working in the shelter and, and, I, and i completely agree on how things are going to change and right now the conversation is you know the shelter is hiring you know cbo's to provide service uh, community based organizations to provide services to the shelter for the patient but the shelter uh, in new york city remain continues to say you know we are not uh, primary care providers we our goal is to house people and the rest needs to be addressed so there's this co ongoing conversation i completely agree with you that the, the narrative needs to change and i congratulations on being well today i i, I thank you for sharing that dr Karen, there's a new shelter in town we're legal form incorporation with a 5013 status okay we're private but we have incorporated wraparound services all on site, meaning medical, mental health, substance abuse counseling, and even veterinarian. Because me as a person with lived experience, I believe that you have to address the issue first in order for you to move forward to make better changes for yourself. If you don't address the issues first and say a person's in the congregated shelter and you give them a voucher and you put them in an apartment and they got a drug problem, how long do you think they're gonna keep that apartment? Correct. Okay. Or if you got a person that is uh has a mental problem and they go in a shelter and they haven't done a psychosocial or psych evaluation or medicated management and they put them in a uh, apartment, how long before you think they to compensate, okay, and be out of that apartment? So it's like the city is going of New York City is going backwards. We need new ideas. We need new solutions, okay. And they got to take the band-aid off because it's a massive system failure. Okay, this is systematically by design. This has nothing to do with color. Okay, because you got white Puerto Rican black people since this pandemic, lost jobs, foreclosures. Okay, property loss. Okay, evicted. Okay, uh, 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 in tents. Okay, we had tents. People in tents down the block at Union Station. And down the block from the Capitol, the White House, families in tents. And now guess what? In the five boroughs, tents is popping up. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell, for your really thoughtful conversation. Appreciate it. Um, we have Ms. Mitchell, I recommend that you send that resource to us uh, to share. Yeah. Uh, and, and thank you. And uh, we have some more questions in the chat. I want to make sure we get these. Um, um so one person asked i think you covered this but what is the reason for new york having uh fewer homeless people i think less homelessness yeah it's it's dhs well yeah and we'll send out the slide so um you can review that um how much this is from uh k anthony hernandez how much of mentality plays in long-term homelessness i'm not sure what what they mean by long term uh, by mentality so I, I, what i was saying earlier is that the longer someone is is homeless the more traumatic it is and there's a sense of uh, demoralization and hopelessness and helplessness with that especially when there be systemic barriers preventing someone from getting the resources they need um, uh, and they've tried a lot. So there's this sometimes sense of giving up. And so the person who's properly trained in engaging individuals who face that, that demoralization, um, and sometimes people are dehumanized, they feel dehumanized after being out for a while, really needs to be trained into addressing that. Because if you're not, when you find somebody who says, oh, I don't want it, it's fine, then an untrained person will just walk away when it needs to look deeper into what has been going on and acknowledge the person's trauma and acknowledge the person's history and validate uh, uh, that in order to engage better and try to, uh, uh, but it takes time, it takes persistence to get to, to get to work with someone with that. That's why this work can be so challenging. Thank you. And we have a request in the chat to stop sharing the screen, I think, so people, yeah. so people can see you. Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, 
let's see what else. Um, we have some comments. Um, King Peter said, this is a touching story. Um, we have people who've been coming from the mental health field, uh, Rosemary for 35 years, excellent workshop. Um, Rosemary said, um, there are many communities that follow the not in my neighborhood or not in my backyard thinking. Um, we should be able to override that thinking. I want to point that Madeline has been raising. I'm not, I don't know. I don't okay. want to say he or she, I cannot tell, but I've, I've, I've noticed the hand being raised there. Okay, I missed that. Yeah, Madeline, do you have a question? Yes, I have a question and, and a comment. Thank you so much for um, for this presentation. It was very informative. Um, from the outside, because I'm not in the field, but from the outside and living in Harlem where we're seeing a lot of the consequences of people being homeless in terms of street activity, it appears that the city has, has does not have a comprehensive program. Mm -hmm. And this might not be in your field at all. Uh, to create affordable housing, mm -hmm. but yeah. a lot of money seems to be going into shelters and temporary and transition and those kinds of housing. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if in your, your research and conversations and discussions, are there any, um, anything happening around that? Because my, again, not being in the field, that if people had affordable housing, uh, for example, you know, Harlem was gentrified, so a lot of the affordable housing is no longer here. So people who did not have any of those problems uh, that you listed that usually generates uh, you know, uh, homelessness just didn't, couldn't afford um, sure. to, to live anymore. So just wondering about your reaction to a, a larger picture of, of the city addressing a for, lack of affordable housing. The other part of this, is there any data that says at what, is there a turning point in which uh, the longevity of being homeless impacts a person's capacity to transition back into a, a housing situation, a stable housing situation. Thank you. Amazing, uh, amazing, amazing, amazing. Um, thank you so much uh, for, 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 for bringing those. Um, okay, the first part to your question is, it's, it, there's that many things. <laughs> and again, I wanna say that I have my own personal opinion about things and I'm always speak from my organization. Um, there are many factors that plays here. Um, it's the factor of when we look at the demographic of individuals who are homeless, when we look at the system addressing that, you know, um, the priority is not very high. I mean, we we are aware of 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 this. You know, when when they came and identified Harlem, and I live in Harlem myself, they were not concerned about who couldn't afford uh, there, and they were not of concerned about displacing. Um, uh, and those individuals. So there's the political aspect to that that is very prevalent um, and detrimental to the health and just well being of, of those living around there. Um, health and hospital, actually, and I'm going to link this to the second part of your question is that health and hospital is trying to work with organization, whether it's housing or human resources uh, administration, to not only address the healthcare aspect, because right now we're also realizing that health care management is also health, right? Comprehensive services, wraparound services, um, like Ms. Mitchell was saying, is also part of health. And how do we even get that paid, right? Because when we think of reimbursement and payment of services, we always think medication and diabetes and all of that, but housing is health, right? So how do we even get to get all these organizations working together and even get housing paid for somebody who meets criteria, affordable housing paid by saying, this is how we, these are the social determinants of health that we have assessed for this person. And based on that, the housing should be considered, because housing is health, uh, should be paid for. How do we say, it's, a, it's, a, it's, you know, as you know, Madeline, I think I don't have to tell you, this is gonna be, this is gonna take years to happen, but it's a thought. Right, it is that people are thinking. Um, the other system barrier that I feel like that is so important is that is a failure into the system, and that our knowledge is, um, you know, big systems tend to do the work bottom 
down instead of down up. We tend to want to say, this is what these people need. And we don't come down and sit with them and say, what do you need? And we assume that we know more than they do. Um, and so a conversation, in my opinion, needs to be had in the community and say, what is going on? Like, not just policies, like just sit down with those living in the community and say, these are the issues that we're facing. Let's have a conversation about how to go from there, bottom up. Uh, and, and we don't see that. And I think that would be that living experience. I mean, like all these things can then bring out a, a more intense conversation than, than us, you know, me staying in my office and giving this lecture, which I love and it's great, it's engaging. But, you know, I, I always have the mindset of if you sit down with those living in Harlem, and I live in Harlem, you know, uh, experiencing this condition and saying, how can we help? What has been done? What do you find helpful? It would be much more in fact, impactful than, than, than everything else. I hope that answers your question in some yeah, ways. Yes, it, it definitely did. And um, the other part of that that I find, I think somebody even put in the comment or made a comment about um, when you raise the issue, you often get shut down by saying that not in my neighborhood person, when that's really not, there are probably some people that like that, but it, it sort of, it, it blocks the conversation um, because people, you know, NIMBYs and all that kind of stuff, gentrifiers. So even somebody who's lived in Harlem all your life, all their lives has, can't find the avenue to open up that conversation. So I appreciate it the fact that that's something that you and I guess your colleagues are are talking about that bottom yeah. down because yeah. it impacts it impacts everyone in the in the community. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I don't know if have if others have questions. Um, we have some comments from Ms. Mitchell in the chat about um, Dr. Zodem, I think something you experienced with the um, affordable housing being the city's affordable housing is often for people really with middle incomes. And then the vouchers we rely on often uh, for housing for people who are experiencing homelessness like Dree, Scree, Feps, Section 8, their, their values are very low. It's very hard to find housing under those income or those uh, rent limits. Um, yeah, you know it's 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 one thing. Uh, you know, I have a I have a young patient um, who uh, grew up in the foster system, and after he was discharged from the foster system, he was put into NYCHA, and and you know, so he's not homeless technically, but my young patient was not prepared to get into NYCHA. He is always in a hospital, always in a psychiatric hospital, found in the subway, naked, always in a psychiatric hospital to the point where we don't know really how to connect him. And when I met him, I thought he was homeless. He kept telling me, I live in this street. I was like, why are you always in the subway? And we found out that he actually has an apartment, but it was not a proper apartment for him. And when I went to his apartment, there was trash everywhere. I actually took him, walked him to his apartment from the hospital. There was trash everywhere. I mean, he couldn't quite care for himself for himself, like he had been living in garbage, you know, the, 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 it was just the most, but the system see him as housed, the problem is fixed. They move him from the foster system to that, but with no resources and no connection, no care coordination, right? And so I, I, I sometimes want to say to, to all of us that yes, housing is, is, we want to be housed, but you know, we also want to be properly housed. It's not only a roof over our head. You no, know, I, I tend to give this analogy. There's a difference between a house and a home. It's, it's, it's a completely, it's a concept that I think about all the time. And when most of us go home, we consider it a place that is safe. We consider it the place that we can be ourselves. We consider it a place where we can put our head on the pillow and be fine. Um, and we, there's, a, there's an emotional, uh, aspect of what we consider home. But some of the, what the state or what the, the, the vouchers, the, like some of these places are just, I mean, I've had patients who have, the longer you are outside, you know, they prefer to be outside. I have patients who prefer to sleep in the concrete than being in the shelter. 
although the shelter has the roof, there's a roof over their head. And then some people sometimes say, but just go to the shelter. Well, if you haven't been to the shelter, this it's not, it's, it's you know, Claire knows it's, it's, it's very interesting to be there. So even when somebody said they, they, they had to sleep outside and compared to the shelter, we want to understand the type of housing they need um, and why was the shelter not the place in which they could stay. And everybody's story is different uh, in terms of that. And unless we start looking into that, housing would not always be the solution. <laughs> You know, putting somebody into affordable housing and giving them vouchers would not always be the solution unless we understand what the barriers have been. What is systemic barriers? What is, you know, whatever it was the condition, like unless we really dig deeper into what has been happening to, to a person um, uh, to help provide them with the right resources, you know, like somebody was saying, they might not stay in the apartment, they might just leave the next day. You know, if somebody stays outside the longer, longer time, there's uh, people have told me like some, some of our homeless patients have said there's a social aspect to be homeless. You know, you might not interact with people, but there's noise, you're around people, you feel a little safer, it's a thing. And then certainly we put you in an apartment where it's deathly silent and you're there by yourself. We conceptualize that, just you. And for 20 years, you were in Central Park or wherever, or in Times Square, and there was just this busy, and now you have a so-called home. How do you stay there? How did you, how, how did you didn't transition to get there? So how is that? And so we sometimes see in my field, people who get into an apartment and they leave, and they go back to, to Penn Station. Uh, and we don't only say they abandon their housing, that but it's just, how do we transition to that, right? How do we work with understanding if that environment was appropriate and if they were even ready to be in the small space by themselves? So it's, it's such a big discussion and I'm very passionate about it and we can have this all day, but you know, home versus house, um, health is housing. Um, although housing is health and both actually. Thanks, Dr. Zodom, for that thoughtful discussion. Um, I want to be mindful of your time. Um, I don't know if we have any last questions, but we have some, um, just some quick comments in the chat from Jerry Lynn Mabry. Um, she's, they say, thank you very much, Dr. Zodom. Um, this has been an informative and thoughtful, comprehensive health strategies. Greetings from Harlem. Um, Madeline Stokely, again, said appropriate housing is very important too in addition to having housing. Um, yeah. So I guess with that, uh, we can wrap up. Oh, OK. Uh, Rosemary said, I'm so glad you're out there working on this for people that need you there. Thank you. So I think the bottom line is this has been a great presentation, a great discussion. Do um, you have any final thoughts? If, yes, and if you guys have any questions or suggestions and want to scream at me and be angry, uh, I will filter your comments if you want to be angry, but I will still read them. Uh, <laughs> please reach out. I'm happy to talk again. Um, you know, I'm very passionate about the community I serve. Uh, it, it really is, uh, um, uh, you know, I've, I've worked uh, in the street. I've worked in supportive housing. I've done work from street shelter, supportive housing, and all these settings, and it's it's quite a story and it's quite something to see and 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 we're just touching the tip of the iceberg and i'm open to conversation on how i in my role as a medical director of homeless services at new york city health and hospital can work with you and even i was telling uh deborah and even into me living in harlem i don't work in harlem anymore i live in harlem you know having a conversation about what we can do uh for for those folks you know, with Harlem changing and becoming what it is today, uh, and those losing resources and losing services and not having appropriate services uh, or affordable services for them uh, when they've been living there for years. I'm open to that conversation. Thank you. Yeah, we're getting some more thank yous in the chat. Um, at the end of this presentation, we'll send out the slides and the recording. You all can share it with your networks. Um, Karen said, thank you so much. Your passion and compassion are appreciated as your wisdom. Thank you. 
I wish you guys an amazing holiday for those who celebrate. And thank you for having me, Claire and, and, uh, and Deborah. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us. On behalf of the School of Public Health and Health Policy, we wish everyone a happy, safe uh, season's greetings and new year. Um, and thank you very much for this informative uh, webinar and this conversation. And congratulations, Claire, on becoming a master's of public health. So please help me welcome our new professional into Thank this. So <laughs> um, this was Thank her you. inaugural and tonight she um, passes over. So we're so excited to have her. And thank you very Thank much uh, for everyone for sharing your time, your energy and your talents. Okay, bye.